The bars whispered wickedly between them. Rook was leading the crowd to the inner cages now. The unicorn asked the tall man, Who are you? I am called Schmendrick the Magician, he answered. You won't have heard of me. The unicorn came very near to explaining that it was hardly for her to have ever heard of one wizard or another, but something sad and valiant in his voice kept her from it. The magician said, I entertain the sightseers as they gather for the show. Miniature magic, sleight of hands, flowers to flags and flags to fish, all accompanied by persuasive patter and a suggestion that I could work more ominous wonders if I chose. It's not much of a job, but I've had worse, and I'll have better one day. This is not the end. But the sound of his voice made the unicorn feel as though she were trapped forever, and once more she began pacing her cage, moving to keep her heart from bursting within the terror of being closed in. Rook was standing before a cage that contained nothing but a small brown spider, weaving a, mo weaving a modest web across the bars. Arachne of Lydia, he told the crowd, guaranteed the greatest weaver in the world. Her fate's the proof of it. She had the bad luck to defeat the goddess Athena in a waving contest. Athena was a sore loser, and Arachne is now a spider, creating only for Mommy Fortuna's midnight carnival by special arrangement. Warp of snow and woof of flame, and never any two the same. Arachne. Strung on the loom of iron bars, the web was very simple and almost colorless, except for an occasional rainbow shiver when the spider scuttled out on it to put a thread right. But it drew the onlooker's eyes, and the unicorn's eyes as well, back and forth and steadily deeper, until they seemed to be looking down into the great rifts of the world, black fissures that widened remorselessly, and yet would not fall into pieces as long as Arachne's web held the world together. The unicorn shook herself free with a sigh, and saw the real web again. It was very simple, and almost colorless. "'It isn't like the others,' she said. "'No,' Schmendrick agreed grudgingly. "'But there's no credit due to Mommy Fortuna for that. "'You see, the spider believes. "'She sees those cat's gradles herself, and thinks them her own work. "'Belief makes all the difference to magic like Mommy Fortuna's. "'Why, if that troop of witlings withdrew their wonder, "'there'd be nothing left of all her witchery "'but the sound of a spider weeping, and no one would hear it.' "'The unicorn did not want to look into the web again.' She glanced at the cage closest to her own, and suddenly felt the breath in her body turn to cold iron. There sat on an oaken perch, a creature with the body of a great bronze bird, and a hag's face, clenched and deadly as the talons with which she gripped the wood. She had shaggy, round ears of a bear, but down her scaly shoulders, mingling with the bright knives of her plumage, there fell hair the color of moonlight thick and youthful around the hating human face. She glittered, but to look at her was to feel the light going out of the sky. Catching sight of the unicorn, she made a queer sound like a hiss and a chuckle together. The unicorn said quietly, This one's real. This is the harpy Seleno. Smendrick's face had gone the color of oatmeal. The old woman caught her by chance, he whispered, asleep as she took you. But it was an ill fortune, and they both know it. Mommy Fortuna's craft is just sure enough to hold the monster, but its mere presence is wearing all her spells so thin that in a little time she won't have the power left enough to fry an egg. She shouldn't have done it, done it. never meddled with a real harpy, a real unicorn. The truth melts her magic, always. But she cannot keep from trying to make it serve her. But this time... Sister of the Rainbow, believe it or not, they heard, they heard Rook braying to the odd onlookers. Her name means Dark One, the one whose wings blacken the sky before a storm. She and her two sweet sisters nearly starved the King Phineas to death by snatching and befouling his food before he could eat it. But the sons of the North Wind made them quit that, didn't they, my beauty? The harpy made no sound, and Rook grinned like a cage himself. She put up a fiercer fight than all the others put together, he went on, but it was like trying to bind all hell with a hair. But Mommy Fortuna's powers are great even enough for that. Creatures of night brought to light. Polly want a cracker? Few in the crowd laughed. The harpy's talons tightened on her perch until the wood cried out. You'll need to be free when she frees herself, the magician said. She mustn't catch you caged. I dare not touch the iron, the, ir the unicorn replied. My horn could open the lock, but I cannot reach it. I cannot get out. 
She was trembling with horror of the harpy, but her voice was quite calm. Schmendrick the magician drew him up, himself up several inches taller than the unicorn would have thought possible. Fear nothing, he began grandly. For all my air of mystery, I have a feeling heart. But he was interrupted by the approach of Rook and his followers, grown quieter than the grubby gang who had giggled at the manticore. The magician fled, calling back softly, Don't be afraid. Schmendrick is with you. Do nothing till you hear from me. His voice drifted to the unicorn, so faint and lonely that she was not sure whether she actually heard it or only felt it brush against her. It was growing dark. The crowd stood in front of her cage, peering in at her with a strange shyness. Rook said, The unicorn, and stepped aside. She heard hearts bounce, tears brewing, and breath going backwards, but nobody said a word. By the sorrow and loss and sweetness in their faces, she knew that they recognized her, and she accepted their hunger as her homage. She thought of the hunter's great-grandmother and wondered what it must be like to grow old and to cry. Most shows, said Rook, after a time, would end here, for what could they possibly present after a genuine unicorn? But Mommy Fortuna's Midnight Carnival holds one more mystery yet, a demon more destructive than the dragon, more monstrous than the manticore, more hideous than the harpy, and certainly more universal than the unicorn. He waved his hand toward the last wagon, and the black hangings began to wriggle open, though there were no one pulling behind them. Behold, Rook cried, behold the last, the very end, behold Eli. Inside the cage, it was darker than the evening, and cold stirred behind the bars like a live thing. Something moved in the cold, and the unicorn saw Eli, an old, bony, ragged woman who crouched in the cage, rocking and warming herself before a fire that was not there. She looked so frail that the weight of the darkness should have crushed her, and so helpless and alone that the watchers should have rushed forward in pity to free her. Instead, they began to back silently away, for all the world as though Eli were stalking them. But she was not even looking at them. She sat in the dark and creaked a song to herself in a voice that sounded like a saw going through a tree, and like a tree getting ready to fall. What is plucked will grow again. What is slain lives on. What is stolen will remain. What is gone is gone. She doesn't look like much, does she? Rook asked. But no hero can stand before her. No god can wrestle her down. No magic can keep her out or in, for she's no prisoner of ours. Even while we exhibit her, she is walking among you, touching and talking, for Eli is old age. The cold of the cage reached out to the unicorn, and wherever it touched her, she grew lame and feeble. She felt herself withering, loosening, felt her beauty leaving her with her breath. Ugliness swung from her mane, dragged down her head, stripped her tail, gaunted her body, ate up her coat, and ravaged her mind with remembrance of what she had once been. Somewhere nearby, the harpy made her low, eager sound, but the unicorn would gladly have huddled in the shadow of her bronze wings to hide from this last demon. Eli's song sawed away at her heart. What is seaborn dies on land, soft is tread upon, what is given burns the hand, what is gone is gone. The show was over. The crowd was stealing away. No one alone, but in couples and fews and severals, strangers holding strangers' hands, looking back often to see if Eli were following. Rook called plaintively, Won't the gentlemen wait to hear the story about the satyr? And sent a sour yowl of laughter, chasing their slow flight. Creatures of night, brought to light! They struggled through the stiffening air, past the unicorn's cage, and on away, with Rook's laughter yapping them home, and Eli still singing. This is illusion, the unicorn told herself. This is illusion, illusion, and somehow raised a heavy head with death to stare deep into the dark of the last cage and see, not old age, but Mommy Fortuna herself, stretching and snickering and clambering to the ground with her old, eerie ease. And the unicorn knew then that she had not become mortal and ugly at all, but she did not feel beautiful again. Perhaps that was an illusion, too, she thought wearily. I enjoyed that, Mommy Fortuna said to Rook. I always do. I guess I'm just stage-struck at heart. You better check on that damn harpy, Rook said. I could feel her working loose this time. 
It was like I was a rope holding her, and she was untying me. He shuddered and lowered his voice. Get rid of her, he said hoarsely, before she scatters us across the sky like bloody clouds. She thinks about it all the time. I can feel her thinking about it. Fool, be still. The witch's own voice was fierce with fear. I can turn her into the wind if she escapes, or into snow, or into seven notes of music, but I choose to keep her. No other witch in the world holds a hot harpy captive, and none ever will. I would keep her if I could do it only by feeding her a piece of your liver 